Hey, everybody. Guess what? We all hear about books, courses, techniques for handling objections. But wait a second. Don't we already know what the objections are going to be? Haven't we heard most of them? 80, 90% of them before? And how about if we prevented them? Wouldn't that be a smarter way? Why don't we take that time, that money, that energy that we put into learning how to handle objections and invest it into how to prevent objections? Now, when I bring this up to sales reps, they kind of, especially experienced sales reps, they they give you that nod like the dog watching TV, like... Uh, There's sound coming out of that box, but I don't know really what it means. And I get it because we've been conditioned to do this. We have to buy a book on objection handling from somebody who's never sold. We have to take a course by somebody who's never sold. But why don't we plan ahead, anticipate the objections we're going to get? Guess what they're going to be? Um, I'm not interested. I don't have time. We don't need that. We're happy with what we're doing. Uh, give us a call back in a, a century. Um, you're too expensive, even though I don't know how much it costs. Uh, I'm not the right person. Um, whatever, you know, whatever. We are intelligent people. We should be able to prevent this in one-tenth to one-one-hundredth the time it takes to try and handle it. Because typically an objection, people say, oh, it's just a buying need in disguise. Oh, go back to sleep. What is it? It means you're moving too fast. You're asking for something you haven't earned. You're just going against the grain. You're doing something that isn't natural, isn't accepted. I'm not interested. Just looking. Guess what? They're a human being. They're conditioned to tell you that. And what do we do? We try and handle it. How much does it cost, even though I don't know what it is? It doesn't matter how much it costs if I don't know what it is. If you don't have the pain, the problem, the need, why are we talking about it? This is all, you know, is it advanced selling? Oh, I don't know what it is, but why not anticipate it? Why not write it down? Why not have a plan not to walk into that trap? You see it, it's quicksand, you've been in it a hundred times, why do we keep walking into it? We're conditioned as sales reps to do what we're told. We listen to the idiots on YouTube and LinkedIn who haven't sold in 10 years trying to tell us what to do, the little platitudes, instead of the people who plan, have a system, come up with a process, and and ask yourself, if I say this, what are they going to say back? It's an old lawyer's trick that they don't ask questions they don't know the answer to. Why? Because they lose control. What we we as salespeople have to guide our customers, our prospects through a process. So we have to know it. If we don't know it, we're just two lost critters out in the wilderness hoping to find a little yummy snack. And guess what? We, We end up eating each other or biting or hating each other. Let's prevent all that. Objections are to be prevented, not handled. Yes, you can't anticipate everything, but and you're going to get pushback. But that some of that's natural. Some of it's a discussion. I'm talking about the blatant, you know, hand in the face, stonewalled, get out of here. Uh, let me come up with an excuse. You, you've, we've all heard them. It's like, get out of my way. Get off the phone. Leave me alone. I want to move on with my life because I, s- I see no need. So today, I'm taking a different approach. I put out the video uh, probably about a month ago on LinkedIn about how to prevent objections instead of handling. It it caused such a stir. You know, these sales reps, sales managers, sales trainers were like, you can't anticipate everything. And it's like, no, but 80% of it you can. And then you get the, oh, it's it's just a buying signal in disguise. Well, um, we're not interested. It's not a buying signal in disguise. I don't have time. I'm the wrong person. It's too expensive. That's not a buying signal. That's a you're annoying me signal. So we have to understand what we're up against, what it is, and how to guide ourselves to not step in the poo-poo, okay? Let's not do that. Let's not dirty our shoes and walk around the house. Why don't we... Look for the poo-poo and not step in it. 
Here we go. Is that uh, crazy, radical witchcraft? No, that's logical, sensible approach. I have a rep, and the rep commented on the post, and it goes, well, tell me how. And I go, well, it's a little bit too much for a LinkedIn comment. How about coming on the podcast, and we'll jump through it. We'll talk about it. That way I'll have somebody live, somebody who's not in the course, not a podcast listener, nobody who knows me. So let's get into the interview. I'll sum it up at the end, and I'll break this into videos. I'll put it on the YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube, so that you can watch them individually. Love to get your feedback. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Brian. Uh, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I am an enterprise sales rep for a company called NearMap. And we're a publicly traded firm based out of Australia, offices in Salt Lake City, as well as around the, the nation um, with select employees. And we produce HD imagery and aerial data products that are very custom specific to applications like construction, engineering, urban planning, government, insurance, basically anyone who wants to survey land around them, but is frustrated or struggling with the fact that they have uh, a relatively limited team or limited manpower and can't go out there with drones or with their own airplanes to, to do the surveying themselves. We're sort of a one-stop shop, like Google Maps on steroids. Sounds like an easy sale. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, can, it, it, has its, uh, it certainly has its perks. It's a very unique market that we go after in terms of what we provide for value uh, to the types of teams we work with. Cool. Now we had uh, met through uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I had posted a video about objection handling and felt that most of them can be prevented versus handled. Um, Want to dive into that? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, now you probably don't hear many brand new objections, do you? It's very common that you see, I think across no matter what product you're selling, Brian, you see a certain subset of objections or sort of the commonalities based upon the product or the market that you're going after. And so in our case, yes, there are certain common themes of objections. Uh, same with someone who might be selling a hardware product or someone who's selling financial services, right? There's, there's sort of those common objections that come up time and time again so that we try to begin to get used to them, acknowledge them, but then get past them or overcome them. And that's sort of where my curiosity came from in reaching out to you was you're, you're, you're basically talking about overcoming the objection before ever going into receiving objections. Yeah, my point was more, I think we're rushing. And I think what, we, what we're told to do is to pitch and ask for time and then ask for a demo, and then give a proposal, and then handle the pricing objection, the timing rejection. And my point is, you know that's going to happen, so why walk into it? Why not build up to it? Hmm. So, I mean, like the first one is, you know, people typically, you know, I say beg for time or ask for 15 minutes to talk about us, what we do, and how we can help, as opposed to getting into what, what are they up against, what are they interested in, and build a conversation without talking about us, talking about something that mm -hmm. we're both interested in. Which would be more of a cu customer-centric approach, or more Absolutely. of a consultative approach from, from the minute you engage with a prospect. Absolutely. Because... Um, because I think we're under the assumption that it, since it's our job to sell, that it's their job to buy, but they don't care. Mm -hmm. I think we, <laughs> yes, we, I we agree. Yeah, we first have to find out do, do they have the problem that we solve? You know, so how do mm. we di dig into that? Because they don't, when they look at a vendor, a product company, or salesperson, they're thinking, what is it? What does it do? How much does it cost? Mm -hmm. I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. And then you, if that's what they're thinking, 
and we walk into that, uh, they may be in market, they may have a need, but that's probably a needle in a haystack. But I bet most of the people, especially in your space, you know, because I, I was in the, the geospatial space on the government side. Everyone I talked mm-hmm. to had a problem, but they also had a solution that they think is a solution to their problem. Um, but if you take the approach of what would they be curious about, what would they be interested in, you can start a dialogue and not talk about the product, but the problem that you solve. Mm-hmm. And I want to I want to add to that really quickly because one thing that I've seen a lot of my peers do over the years is uh, talk about what we offer as being a solution. We don't offer a solution. We are, we offer a product or service in most cases, or a, a hardware product. And we'll sort of clump those together: SaaS or software or hardware. And the problem is when we go about pitching the value proposition to our prospects, we're talking about offering a solution, but we haven't even uncovered a business problem yet. <laughs> or we haven't dug into the deep roots. And also it's not a solution for us. It's a solution for them. So yeah. that word solution or solving needs to come out of their mouth, not ours. Right. It's like a doctor. Gi- yeah. A doctor giving you a, a bottle of pills uh, without knowing what illness you have. <laughs> Very true. Right. So you take that, Very true. the pills and you're like, I hope this is what's for me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Instead of like, okay, well, what are the typical symptoms that would tell you that that person is qualified? Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a, and, and I also would, I also want to just add one more thing. So one of the schools of thought or one of the things that we've been preached from management over the years, right? When you find a good sales mentor, or you find a good uh, sensei, sort of speak, is overcoming objections by stating them before the prospect has the ability to state them. Now, what you're describing based upon our, our threads so far and some of the, the messaging in your video is that we have to earn the right to overcome the objections. We have to earn the right to. Uh, my, my point is that we don't even approach the state that would cause the objection. Hmm. Okay. Don't ask for time. Okay. Talk about them. Don't give them the impression that you're selling something. Give them the impression that you're curious about them and what they're doing. You know, it's, Approach them like you would if you met them in the real world, say at a party. You wouldn't go up mm-hmm. to somebody and say, um, hey, I solved this, this, and this. Can I have 15 minutes of your time to so- explain how? That would be creepy, <laughs> right? Very true. <laughs> that would be creepy. <laughs> yeah, that would be creepy. <laughs> but if you went up to them and you started talking about the venue, the food, the music, and you didn't look like you were going to grab their time and take a, a whole you know chunk of it that you talk to them as a person mm-hmm. and that comes off very humanistic because what we act like today is you know the, the beggar on the side of the street with a sign up you know sales rep needs uh orders mm-hmm. <laughs> without <laughs> giving anything and I think we, we've That's lost that. True. Yeah. And, and it didn't matter 15 years ago when there's only a handful of people doing it. But now there's hundreds of people doing it across phone, mm. email, social. And until you're known, liked, and have some level of trust, you haven't earned that right to even talk about you, yourself, or your problem, or the product that you have. But if you show interest in them helping them, they, they are open to that. And you build a sense of trust with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'd agree. And l- let me give you an example. I know one of the things we talked about was, was having an example or showing some sort of sales engagement, right, where, where we could use this um, as sort of a tangible way 
to bypass the objections. So let's say we go through the discovery and I learn about their business and we uncover a business problem after going through what Sandler would call the pain funnel. Now, at that point, oftentimes, very common for the types of people I work with to say, great, let's see a product demonstration. I'm also going to include an evaluation team. These could be my direct reports, you know, Harry, Joe, Mary, and Larry. And what they're going to do is they're also going to jump on that product demonstration with me so that we can evaluate this as a team and see visual examples or something custom specific to my business as to how this product or how we might be able to start developing an idea of what we think the ROI is. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, people buy either with emotion or because they're looking to save money or increase their revenue stream. That's sort of my fundamental opinion to a certain extent over most of my sales engagements. Do you own a car? I do. I do. Unfortunately, did, did, sometimes. Yeah. Did you buy it because it saved you money or made you money? <laughs> and to a certain extent, you could say so. I bought it because I needed it to get to uh, the job I had outside of the city of Boston a couple of years ago. Uh, but no, most people don't buy a car because it yeah. saves them money or it makes them money, right? Most people it's buy probably it for how it makes them feel, status, or yeah. right. And I think that's what you know because you're probably selling to technical people as initial users of your product. Definitely. Certainly people that are familiar with products like CAD or GIS yeah. Yeah. or that want to be able to see their properties from over, over a large scale across large cities or large urban areas. Yeah. And so just getting back to my example, right? Yeah. One of the things that, that we find that is an objection, sort of those commonalities or those common objections that the salesperson sees across their industry or their prospective customer organizations for us would be, you know, we don't cover the whole US because what we provide is mapping software or mapping imagery that's so resolute that I could see the flooring on your back porch and tell what type of wood it is from 10,000 feet in the air. Okay. So that so they say, why do you, well, you don't cover my whole business. You don't cover all the properties that I service as an insurance provider, or I'm doing construction work out in uh, Stockton, California, or somewhere that's you know not quite downtown San Francisco. Um, you only cover about a third of my projects or a third of my my business efforts. So that's a common objection we see, and so my you know my assumption just is to as sort of a you know, someone who has been uh, doing this for a while is to overcome that and show them coverage map or, you know, the areas we do cover earlier on after we uncover a business problem or a true initiative that's trying to solve something that's an inefficiency in their business. But what we're saying is that maybe that's not even the right approach, right? Um, that's a better approach. Uh, what I would do is before you have that demo with the team is have you, if you've got enough rapport with that one contact, say like, you know, these demos can go on, turn into proof of concepts. C can I sit down with you for a few minutes and find out how you would use it? What problem are you trying to solve? And so that I can scope that demo that, it, that the people mm. it would be most relevant. Okay. And, and, and try and find out because do they need the whole U S probably not. Right. Mm -hmm. But people, True. yeah. Uh, and you can ask that question before you tell them that you don't cover the U whole U S you know, what area do you really mm -hmm. need? And if it was outside that, is that a big issue or a minor issue? Hmm. Interesting story. Yeah, we're, we're really getting to the uh, fine-tuned details that could be an objection later, but in a positive sort of consultative approach by asking the right questions that say, here's the things that are important to you. Here's the things that are what I would say nice to have. It's not need to have, right? Yes, because most likely they don't need the entire U.S. Um but of course, people like to find flaws in what you do. <laughs> it's 
very true. And that, that's the classic problem you have when you have the one to many demo where like mm -hmm. probably you or you and some engineer are given the demo to this large group. And there's always going to be that one person who's going to try and find the thing that's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And whether it's relevant or not, you know, and they're going to bring up price, even though none of them have any budget authority. It's not their money. <laughs> Right. Very true. Very true. <laughs> and you'll get wrapped around the axle trying to justify the price in that call. And it doesn't matter. Correct. It doesn't matter because they haven't outlined a budget for, or, or maybe even a project at this point. Right. Right. You know, you could be saving them millions of dollars, but if you cost a dollar, that's what they're going to look at. That's very true. Yeah. That's very true. And, and I think we, you know, when a lot of companies, buy with multiple input from different lines of business or different business units these days yeah. to get in true enterprise sale. You have to go through multiple departments and gain their thumbs of approval from start to finish all the way up yeah. to the person who does sign off VP, yeah. C level Absolutely. director, whatever the size of what you're selling is in terms of the pricing. However, there, there is, you're right. There's always, I like to call them naysayers. And it's always fun to try and win a naysayer over to the point where then later on, they're the one using your service or product the most. That, that's, that's an interesting way to help change someone's lives. And it also tells us, or it gives me some comfort that what I'm doing is actually proactive, beneficial, and helping others in society. It gives you more of just a, I'm a salesperson peddling a product with a number over my head who needs to hit that in order to pay my bills, support my family, whatever the case may be. Yeah. But those naysayers may come later in the process. Could be procurement. Procurement loves to beat you up on price because they've been, in many cases, trained to go against some of the sales strategies that we've all been uh, keen to over the years. So let's say we get through the uh, location coverage is not an issue, right? But we get to pricing and they see a fifty or a hundred thousand dollar price point, and the procurement offer says well, that's way too much money than we can allocate for this year. And it's, it's funny, I actually, so I saw your, the video on uh, what if B2B uh, strategy negotiations went on in real life and restaurants or, or similar type public venues. I thought that was funny because well, I, I can some save of these you, things actually do exist. Yeah, I can save you tens of thousands of dollars in commission right now. If it gets to procurement <laughs> and it's approved, you never have to give a penny of discount to procurement. Hmm. You know why? Because it's approved. Why? <laughs> the budget's <laughs> not approved. They're torturing you. <laughs> I mean, they make Al Qaeda look like nice people. You know, they, they, you're, <laughs> you know the waterboard's <laughs> coming out when you're down to procurement. Because they know you need the order. Mm -hmm. That's right? very true. And they, they, that's what they do. They torture you. But... Uh, you know, it took me probably five years to figure this out. And somebody just told me this. He just said, never give them a pop. You know, all you have to do is say, we gave the discount to the executives. You should go check with them and that they know that there's not another penny of margin here. Hmm. So you're really, I don't want to say degrading that person's authority, but you're, because you've already got the seal of approval from the, the yeah, stakeholders. Because, because they have no authority. Their responsibility is to, now procurement, not anyone before procurement, an actual purchasing mm -hmm. agent, contracting officer, whatever title it is, they're in procurement. That person's responsibility is to process a legally binding contract with you. It is you know, they may get bonused on discounts. They may, might be just sport, but that's their responsibility. And, and that's what they get, care about, that that order can be audited and they will not get in trouble. That's why it takes so long is they're checking a bunch mm -hmm. of boxes, making you sure who owns you, that the price is competitive, get two other bids, whatever they're doing to make sure that file is nice and pretty. Then they care about pricing, maybe but you'll get the order. <laughs> and, and I know, Brian, you've been a, a sales leader of multiple teams over your career. So I was curious, can you think of an engagement either 
with your team or with one of your team members over the years where there was a really good concrete example of not overcoming the objections, but just bypassing them altogether and how that ended up helping you uh, sort of either increase your business with a customer or uh, win over that relationship and, and start growing it out. Yeah, I, I think like even the coverage issue is a classic red herring issue. Red herring is something that just doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best approach, because it's going to come up, I bet, in your space eventually, mm -hmm. is when you meet one-on-one -on -one with somebody who owns the problem, you, you elicit the coverage priorities, and you bring it up. It's like, um, well, we cover those. Is there anything else that you need? And they say, well, maybe this, maybe that. I just wanted to ask because we do not cover a hundred percent. I don't want that to be a surprise. Hmm. Okay. Because somewhere along the line is going to come up like price is going to come up at some time, but giving a price to somebody who has no budget authority, an engineer, maybe a first line manager with no ROI, no context to judge value versus cost it's, it's, uh, a, it just delays your deal because they're bringing it up. Not because they're probably bringing it up just to talk, to understand, because all they care about is what does it do? How much is it? You know, when you're looking at a car, um, of course you want to know the price, even if you're not going to buy it, mm -hmm. you, you look for a house, you know, you, you know, price is one of the things, even if you're not going to buy it. But but I would use it, I would throw it back and it's like, well, it's kind of all over the map, but it's kind of, and I'm sure a company your size would have no problem. We've never had that issue. Let's talk about if it's even a match. Hmm, I like that approach. I like that approach. Have you also ever, you know, sometimes people will say, all right, so I'm interested in this. You know, we've got this problem. It's costing me a lot of man hours. I'm not I'm not going home and spending time with my family because I'm so bogged down with the backload of work that I have to do. And I think that something you offer could help me increase my efficiency or productivity. However, I know my boss is going to want to see price and it's going to be one of the first things they ask even before they look at the product. So, you know, can you help me get some idea of what your packaging options sure. are? Well, let's say, let's say it's a hundred K just for argument's sake. I would say, you know, it's anywhere from 10K to 250K, give or take 100K. I totally agree with you. That's what I've used over the years too, is if you give them a window or a variety and say, well, based upon X, Y, and Z companies that I work with that are just like you and some of the teams that I work with just like yours, here's what they often will budget or allocate yeah. for, for this type of project. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the further away you can get from the real number, the better. Because it, hmm. if, if you say, let's say you think it's going to end up at 50K and you say, oh, it's around 40 to 60, um, then they're going to think 50. If you say mm -hmm. it's, you know, anywhere from uh, 25 to 75, give or take 40K. You've given them a window, so you you satisfied the the need. Is it a Tesla or is it a Toyota? Okay, hmm. you know you don't want to say it's a Toyota when it is a Tesla, <laughs> right? Because eventually, you know, because they're thinking thirty, and you show up at sixty or ninety, and you just want to satisfy the curiosity at this point and get back to the, how much does the business solution, how much is that worth? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd agree with you. I'd yeah. agree with you 100% in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Because you absolutely. don't want the quote to go in without the business solution value. Correct. Yeah. Because the manager is going to look at it and go, he's just going to see a number that's a cost. He's not going to see, what do I get? 
Interesting. Interesting. Are there any other types of common objections that you think also fall under this pattern of, you know, we mentioned the red herring, right? And we talked a little bit about pricing. Are there any other common themes that you've seen that could also fit the bill in terms of how we uh, bypass them all together during the sales yeah, cycle? Well, sort of well, just common, common buckets. Sure. You know, the obvious ones are their time, price, and then the next one's urgency. You know, do this this quarter or two years from now. Okay. Um, you're, you're selling something new. And if you're doing a cold outreach, there's no urgency on their side yet. Mm -hmm. As opposed to someone who's inbound, has a recognized problem, and is looking for a solution. So what you mm -hmm. want to do is you keep the momentum going. Uh, to the point where you don't run into, ah, we'll look at it next year. Hmm. So you have to come up with why now versus two years from now. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Why now? Why, why us and why now too? Also, Furthermore. yeah. Hmm. So, so I think okay. what happens today is uh, reps – in the cold outreach, move too fast. You know, what happens is you get the presentation, demo, proposal, and then it dies, or what people call no mm -hmm. decision. Right? Sound familiar? <laughs> very true. <laughs> right. It sounds very familiar probably to most of us out there. Yeah, because that's like, okay, first date, second date, prenup. <laughs> 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 or proposal, whichever you prefer. Yeah, I was about to say proposal, not even prenup. Yeah. And then it becomes scary to them. And there's no momentum anymore. You, uh, they've got everything they think they need. And you don't have any control anymore. Meaning mm -hmm. that there's nothing they're asking for. And there's no next step other than order, no order. So what happens is what everyone calls no decision, but it's just, it's, it's backburnered. It's, it's in somebody's email box. Uh, we're waiting for somebody to sit down and look at it. Uh, we're comparing mm -hmm. it against the alternatives. And this is, I call it the mystery middle because until you've been selling for five or 10 years and you've been burnt so many times that you don't know that this is going to happen. This is going to happen Correct. 80, 90% of the time. The, <laughs> the natural effect is to not buy. It is not to buy. And, and this is the, you know, is, is it an objection? It's, no, but it's a stall. It's a, you know, it, it's scary. Um, there's now people who weren't in the demo, weren't in the presentation, who don't own the business problem, whose approval you now need that you don't know. And you're relying Correct. on those champions who, you know, they've now got the football, but they've never played football before. <laughs> so they're like throwing the ball. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. They don't know where the goal line is. And all mm -hmm. they see is people and obstacles ahead of them. And then they're like, this is scary. This is work. Maybe we can live with <laughs> the current solution. Maybe we can you know, just wait another quarter. Or maybe we can do nothing. Exactly. Do nothing. Yeah. Which is a decision. It is. I agree with you. It is a decision. And it's a reason why we lose deals. But then again, I think it largely in my world, and I'm not saying this is the case for everybody out there, but it comes down to tying a true dollar value after we uncover all of the that, that's that's all the issues. Yeah, that becomes the business issue. But you also got to understand that if that number is given to somebody who either doesn't have the budget authority, can't take that purchase request and approve it as the final approver, then you've got to talk to the the steps who do have to approve that. Hmm. And, and this is where reps gets um, first. They're not aware of it. Second, they don't haven't met those people. And, and third, they don't know what that person cares about and why they would mm -hmm. do it. 
So you're relying on your contact, your champion, to guide that purchase request through their system. And they've never done it for whore, or they, they haven't done it in a while, and they don't have the political savvy and capacity, especially technical people, to know how to do that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, Brian. So for me, the best engagements from start to finish in terms of a sales process that I've been a part of, and these, you know, I think we all need to be mindful of the fact that we're, our time is also worth money. Our time is also <laughs> very important. <laughs> and asking for time sometimes is, is something that uh, goes against us or can degrade the value of us as professionals. So the best sales engagements or the best customer in interactions that I've had over the years are when we get through uncovering the business problem, we go through some sort of a proof of concept or a model to show them how this can impact their world. And we don't get to price or pricing and packaging until those things are done. Because if there's a problem or a struggle that's, that's so in, just negatively impacting their operations to a certain extent, they don't care about price at that point in time because there's so much pain or there's so much emotional distress as a result of what they're doing. And that's where, when I find those, you don't often find them all the time, right. but when I find those, that's where I tend to really ingrain and input most of my efforts and energy. And that's it. Because if, if that pain isn't discovered and recognized by them, and, and not just the end user, but the person above them who has to approve this, and that's why giving a price to somebody who doesn't have final economic approval, especially anything less than disc, uh, list price, is dangerous uh, because you're giving it to somebody who's not experienced in getting things done um, politically. I'm sure nobody at your company taught you how to buy stuff for your company. Did you go to a purchasing? That's very true. <laughs> right? No. No. Do you know how to fill out a purchase request at your company? No, I do not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've worked at 12 companies. No one ever taught us how to do that. You know why? They don't want us spending their money. You know, our job mm, is to that's do a something. really good point. Yeah. <laughs> our job is to make other people spend money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's been very, very helpful, Brian. And, uh, Certainly, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to cover too, but I, I, I thank you for understanding, not overcoming, but bypassing objections. I think you've earned the new name, the Objection Godfather. <laughs> and I think the Godfather. The Godfather. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, it, it didn't. It isn't innate, and it's not taught anywhere. You know, we we hear hmm. about you know how to build interest, and oh, there's a committee. But until you've done it for a long time and your income is based off of it and you're a competitive person and you, I mean, because you, you work hard, you put effort into these Correct. opportunities. And when they stall, uh, that's lost investment. That's true. That's very true. And our, our managers may not even be aware that this happens because they're used to the active pain sales cycles the people who are in market who have that pain that you described where cost is very secondary to capabilities. Mm. So, so they're used to people wanting to negotiate, wanting to get something done. They're not used to the, you know, the grinders out there who are working with the, you know, the B level opportunities, the ones where we're building up the need, where we're building up the justification with people who, don't have economic authority yet. But I'll let you get back to selling. I like that definition. <laughs> I like that definition of B-level. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on the show today. Cool. We'll see you soon. We'll see Bye you. now. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I'm going to put that on YouTube. There's a video of it. I think I might start doing the podcast with video. Some people like that. Some people don't. Uh, I hope the quality was good enough that you made it through to this point. And really type to think, try to think about the objections you typically hear. Make a list of them. 
you know, at, at every stage and ask yourself, how could I have prevented it? There is a way. And ask yourself, if I did prevent it, would, is that smarter? Hmm, maybe. And think about your whole deal, your whole process. How can I prevent radio silence, deal slipping, no decision, uh, asking for a discount every step of the way? Did you hear that part? If you didn't, go back. You're giving away money. You're giving away a lot of money. I bet about 5% of your income is being given away to procurement for no reason. So check it. Also, what else? Co-video. I'm getting more and more video emails. People are loving them. Really appreciate the people who send them. Check it out for yourself. Video emails, the way to crack through the noise this year. Also, hey, if, you, if you're sick of hearing me talking about the training course, you can stop right now. Or you can write a bad review, whichever you find more useful. Thanks, Hillary. I'm going to get you. And uh, here's the courses at b2brevenue.com. Uh, this, uh, I'm going to extend it for one week, getting the questions that sell course included. If you buy, start the conversation, get the meeting or closing the complex sale. So that's a $500 value that will be included with a coupon code. So it's not going to read your mind that you bought the course. You'll have to enter a coupon code, but that coupon code will be in the first chapter, the office hours chapter of the course, which has all the instructions on when the office hours is, how to get it on your calendar, how to click on the link, send me questions before. Now this course, it's not just videos. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm having meetups twice a month, group, one to many, on Zoom uh, Fridays. The other thing is you get coaching, mentoring, help. You get to talk to somebody about your deals in a anonymous way and have it be recorded and put in the course so others can benefit from it. But it gets you to talk to somebody about it. Get to pick my brain. It's with me. And what we do is we talk about applying the course to your particular problem. And we abstract out your company name, your customers, your product, all the things that would identify you. So it's completely uh, semi-private. Uh, so what you do is you get some help. You get to talk to somebody for a whole year. Imagine how much more you would make. And people say, how much does it cost? Well, it costs negative $300,000. Negative $300,000. That means you're going to make $300,000 more a year by taking the course. So shut the hell up and get the course. I'm sick of you little pansies out there. I'm saving my pennies. I'm saving my pennies. I'm making 80K a year, but look how many pennies I've got. Brian, you're not getting any of my pennies. Okay, okay. You guys enjoy working for Comcast the rest of your life. <laughs> well, the rest of us are going to go to that top 1%. Yeah, no matter what AOC says, they're not taking our money, are they? So let's learn how to sell. Let's learn how to do it better. And it doesn't. it's not about knowledge. It really isn't. It's about becoming better every day. We're performers. Think of any athlete. You think they don't practice? They don't have coaches? They don't talk to somebody? They don't watch the game tape? Of course they do. That's how they get better. That's how they stay the same. Otherwise, they rust. They get a little loose, a little stiff, a little uh, groggy even. So they aren't performing at that level. If you paid $25 million for an athlete and they didn't show up for practice, what would you do? You'd be like, why are you showing up for practice? Because I paid $25 million. What we are as salespeople, we have to earn our contract every day. We have to earn each penny, each deal. And to become good at that, we have to have our system. And we can either do it by hunting and packing, or we can do it by putting it together and helping somebody and other people help us out, see what other people are doing, and get your game to the next level, the top 1%. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please check out the YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube. Just all separate words. Don't put them together. It'll come right up. And there's tons of stuff there. There's tons of podcasts, sales questions podcasts, B2B revenue leadership podcasts. Are you listening to them? Come on. Get off your butt and sell something.